Well, I was doing all right, and then Daniel prayed for me. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> oh. Daniel is such a gift to us. For two older guys, where's, where's my brother Kevin? Isn't he a gift to us, Kevin? He is a gift to us. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> Our whole staff is a gift. Let me just say that. Me and Kevin, over 20 years, seems like 50. (laughs) No, Uh, so grateful. (laughs) He'd say the same about me. Uh, Seems so, just so grateful. It's just, it's good to be with family, work with family. We really are. We fight. Like I say, me and my wife, they're good fights. We fight good, amen? And, uh, and we love each other deeply. And I think you guys see that. And I think it translates to all of you, amen? Anyway, I don't mean to talk about that. So I'm not responsible for what I say up here. It has been a long, awesome weekend. And uh, I am really tired, but I am good tired. And the kids were great. Your kids were awesome. And thank you for your prayers. It was just so good to just um, be here and have students here and watch them worship. And that's where my heart is always at. And so just thank you for that. And kids, they did great. Like our students did great. And our leaders, our volunteers are an awesome team. So anyway, um, anyway, I just wanted to share that and just say thank you to Jesus. And we had one for sure. Uh, I know you say, how do you know for sure? I'm just telling you, sometimes you just know. Um, she, she declared it, one for sure, Anaya is her name, gave her light to Jesus. We have a sister in the kingdom of God, a new believer. Amen. And uh, it was awesome. And many other kids and who knows who else, but, uh, but it's been good. Here's, um, as I was uh, praying in that room, um, God wanted me to share with you, and I know you know this, but we need to know this, that we we may have a new president, but we have the same king. And... uh, and, uh, and he's not going to change, amen? And, and I know sometimes, so, much, so often we talk about, and trust me, this relates to what we're talking about, as you can tell, um, this morning. Um, but but uh, trust me, I know we talk a lot about God's sovereignty, but I, I don't bank so much on God's sovereignty as much as I bank on his goodness. I mean, anyone can have control, anyone can have power, but it's his goodness and love that I'm banking on. It's because he's faithful. It's because he's a good father that I know he's going to work all things out for my good and his glory because he loves us. Amen? That's why I'm putting my trust in God through any time, and, uh, and I'm just grateful. Of course, you see there, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, I thought about wearing a cardigan, but thank God I don't have a cardigan, and, uh, and came up here. But... Um, but, uh, and wearing my kicks, you know, Mr. I don't even have Mr. Rogers kicks, I don't have those. But anyway, um, but we're going to talk about who is my neighbor living in an us and them culture. And I know we hear this all the time, like, it's getting worse and worse, and, and it used to be better. And, and you know what? I don't know. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. I think it's been worse before, and I think it's been better before. I think it ebbs and flows in all, of, in, in all of humanity. It's always been bad at times, and it's always been good at times. And, and let's be real. Has it ever been good on this side of fallen creation? Because if it is, why would God have to redeem it? Why would God say, we need to make a new heaven and a new earth? So trust me, it's never been good as God created it when he said, and it was good. But one day it will be good again. And we're not there yet. And we're not there yet. But listen. But we, his people, can be the ones who share that created and anointed and ordained goodness, the love of God. That's why we're here. That's why God doesn't hold the world accountable as far as for bringing redemption and healing and the gospel. He says, if my people, right, we like to quote that, if my people who are called by my name, he doesn't say if the world would do it, he doesn't expect blind people to see. If my people, whose eyes are wide open, who know my love and have my spirit, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and seek my face, then, he says, then I'll hear from heaven. Then I'll hear from heaven. And, and, and that's what we're called to do in all of this. It's not that confusing. We've, in all of this, even though it's been difficult and it's been trying, We've, we haven't lost what we're called to do. We never decided, what do we do today? We share the gospel. 
We share the gospel. We share the gospel. We're not going to stop sharing the gospel. Amen. Loving neighbor. That's, that never changed through any of this. Now, we had to pivot, and, and, and how do we do that? But, but, but the mission will never change on this side of heaven until Jesus returns. And so who is neighbor? Because we are living in an us and them culture, but it's always been an us and them culture. I don't care what culture you came from, what side of the Atlantic you're on. I travel. Some of you travel. Isn't it us and them cultures everywhere? Aren't there always someone else to look at like this? No matter where you go. When we go to Mexico, Willie, our pastor, says, well, you got to watch out over there. <laughs> and the people over there say, we got to watch out for them over there. It's us and them everywhere. It's human nature. It's fallen, broken human nature. And only Jesus can bring the we. Only Jesus can bring the solidarity and unity as we seek his face, as we learn from him. So let's kind of move through as we talk about this. So here's what I want you to see right off. God doesn't see sides. He only sees sons and daughters. Listen, those of you who are parents, do you see sides in your family? In fact, when your family sides up, you get upset. I promise you, that upsets the heart of God. Doesn't change his love, but he's like, oh, come on, really? Is this what we're doing? Is this what we're doing? We're doing sides, my kids? are doing sides. That's not the heart, that's not what the father wants. And anytime we forget he's a father, we miss it. We miss it. Take a look here, I wanna share with you. See, we were made in his image, and, and you know who else is made in images? Children are made in their parents' image. They bear the DNA of mom and dad, yes? See, children are made in image of. Children are. And God says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And then it says, in that likeness and image, he created them, male and female. Female wasn't secondary. Female wasn't an afterthought. Oh, look at Adam. I screwed him up. I need a woman. No, it was from the beginning, male and female. I mean, we can almost buy that one. I get it. But it was male <laughs> and female. He created them. And he said, be one, be fruitful and multiply hey, I want you to join me in, in this image-bearing creation. I want you to make more image-bearers. Make more image-bearers. See, they're all his kids. From the beginning, it was always about a family. From the beginning, it was always about a dad and his kids. I say that all the time because I need to remember that. See, even Jesus, when he comes, he comes to show us that God is Father. See, uh, we, I, when we had that Saturday prayer, um, I don't know, over a month ago, um, God had me share. From, uh, he had me share when I got here to just kind of do the exam and prayer. He had me share and say this, that some of you need to take God, and he needs to move from God to Father. He needs to move from God to Father. Because all through Israel, he was always just God. In fact, to the point where they couldn't even say his name fully. They wouldn't even write it down. They spelled it Yahweh, and they left out the vowels in case they would blaspheme and spell it wrong, and, and then God would destroy them. And when Jesus comes, what does he say? Because it was unheard of. No rabbi would have said this. No, no high priest would have taught this or shared this. It would have never come out of their mouth. No Pharisee would even dare to say this. And Jesus comes on the scene and he starts talking about God as what? Father, Father, Father. When you pray, say Father. Well, I, I promise you, they would have hiccuped hard, all the teachers and all the Israelites. Whoa, 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 be careful. He's not Father. Don't, you, we don't even say his name. Jesus says, Father. He says, look, he cares about you. Like a father. I mean, over and over, he uses the word Father. You can check those out for yourself. Those are a couple he said he needs to move from God to Father. This is relational. It's always been about a family, a dad and his kids. Take a look. Joshua 5.13 shows us that God and good fathers don't choose sides. In fact, this is all the way in the Old Testament. Like if there's ever going to be a time God was picking sides, 
it was when the nation of Israel had kind of begun through Abraham, right? And, and, like, and, and like now they're getting ready to claim new territory, move into the promised land. Like if God's ever going to choose sides, it's going to be for his team Israel, right? And whoever else they got to go against, all those ites, right? Start with Jericho, then you get into the Jebusites, the Perizzites, the Amalekites, and then the Philistines. They're not a knight, right? But he goes through all of that. And, and if, if there's going to be a time for a father to choose sides. Shouldn't it be then? But that's not what we see, and we miss this. We miss this. Can I say this? Because we kind of really, and Kevin says this too, and Daniel says this, we just, we're not really people of the word. We're people of a lot of things. And I'm telling you, we, we get led into all sorts of crazy areas because of it. Because we let Facebook and other things lead us. And we don't, and we don't challenge those, those ideologies and philosophies with what the truth says. And so we're in bondage because lies put us in bondage, but truth sets us free. Amen. And then we go, what's wrong? I go to church. Well, nothing says going to church equals freedom. That'll get you to hear some, but you can't hear that much because only, you only got 45 minutes here. And so that doesn't work, right? And so Joshua 5, 13 through 15, right? And I'll just let you see this. Check this out. So this is now, they're getting ready to go into Jericho, all right? And it says, now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him and with, is that like man standing together? A man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? I don't show the next slide yet. Are you for us or for our enemies? Notice, we got enemies. At least that's what Joshua thinks. And Jesus says this. Go ahead, because there's a guy, and this guy is Jesus. I kind of gave it away, right? But you can check that out. This is called a theophany. This is Jesus who comes incarnate, the second person of the Trinity, captain of the Lord's army he's going to reveal himself as. And he says this. He says neither. What? Whoa, hold on. Can you imagine what Joshua would have thought right there? What do you mean? This is Jer- you told us to go into Jericho to take over territory, and there's a whole big theology we can get into on how this works, and we're not going to be able to get into it today. But think about this. He says neither. I'm not on sides. I love, I love all. He says, neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. As representative of the Father, I've come. Then Joshua fell, because he realizes who this is now. Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for a servant? At this point, a little later, you see uh, Jesus, as captain of the Lord's army, tells him to take his shoes off because he's in the presence of God. The place where you're standing is holy ground, Joshua. Let's get first things first. Worship is first. Let's get first things first. All right, amen? And so here's what we need to know when it comes to family. There are no winners and losers in family. Only heartache and celebration. Come on, right? That's all that exists. Hey, I mean, where in family is there winners and losers? That's a messed up family. But there's only heartache and celebration when we see it as family. I mean, we won. What does that mean when it comes to whether it's politics or, I mean, did we, who, and we, and who did we beat and how did we beat them? Like, yeah, I get it's playful and stuff like that. That's fine. But when it comes to life, I mean, are, are there really winners and losers? In any of it? No, it's just heartache and celebration. In fact, that's what you see with the parable. And of course, you know, we say this a lot here. We don't call it the parable of the prodigal son. We call it the parable of the father who has two sons, both who have prodigaled in their own way, right? Both who have went astray in their own way, right? And so Luke 15, 11 through 32, I'm just going to summarize this, but you know the story, right? The younger brother goes to the father and says, Father, give me my inheritance. Pretty much saying, I wish you were dead, and we won't get into all that for time's sake. And the father actually gives it to him, which is crazy for a Middle Eastern culture. It's the hugest insult you can imagine for a son to pretty much say, I wish you were dead because inheritance comes when you die. So give it to me now because you're you're only that useful to me, God. Kevin's done a lot of funerals. He's seen this in person, fighting over stuff, right? Not grieving, but fighting over things, not grieving over a soul, 
And so, um, so a father has two sons, and so he says, give me something. The father actually gives it to him, which is amazing. And then, of course, we know what he does. He spends it on all sorts of crazy kind of living, high street living, right, we call it here. And uh, finally, he realizes, you know what, I'm starving. This ain't working out for me. And uh, man, even the servants in my father's house do better than I do, than I am right now. He goes, you know what, I'm no longer, you know, he goes, I don't even think I'm a son anymore. I, I rather... I don't even know if he'll accept me as a son. I'm going to go back, and he does the whole talk of, like, kind of saying his own, like, all right, this is what I need to say, Dad. I need to say, hey, uh, would you just take me as a servant? Just take me as a servant. I don't even think I'm fit to be called your son anymore. Just take me back as a servant. So he gets that whole talk, and he goes. And the Bible says when he was far off, his father, what, saw him. Do you know why? Because his father loved him. Even though he was insulted by him tremendously, he was still every day would go out to that porch. Where's my son? I miss my son. And when he saw him afar off, he ran to him. And, and the son went to go give this speech, and hey, can you just hire me back as a servant? I'm not even worthy to be called your son anymore. And he, ah, ah, ah. he says, stop right there. You see, here's what sin does to us, because you're going to see it in the other brother. Sin steals sonship from us. Here's what I mean by that. When you and I are the person who sins, 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 we don't feel like a son and daughter of God anymore, do we? No. See, sin steals sonship. In fact, on the other end, when you're self-righteous and you think, well, I'm holy, God's lucky to have me, that's the older brother, right? If you know this story at all, the older brother, you know what? That steals sonship too because he failed to see his own brother as a son of the father anymore too. See, self-righteousness, which is also sin, like, I'm good, you know, God's glad to have me. We don't see other people as God's children, only us. We get an us and them mentality, just like the older brother got. Because when he finally comes, there's a huge party for the son, and he brings him home, and the father's now celebrating, right? Because, because what? That kind of love either mourns or celebrates, right? And so, so they're celebrating, and the older brother hears it. Let me ask you a question. Where should the older brother been the whole time? If he saw this as family... Where should the older brother been the whole time? On the front porch with the dad. Like any good brother would do. Looking for his brother every day with the dad. Where's my brother? Where's my brother? Because it's funny, when the son, the father goes out to, to, to talk to the older brother who won't come into the party, and he, and he says this. He says, come on in. And he says, I'm not coming in. I worked for you all my life. I've done every, I've been good. I'm a good boy. I go to church all the time, and, and he's riotous living, and he wastes all your stuff. He's concerned about stuff again. He says, this son of yours, he calls him. You ever do that, parents, when you get upset at your kids? Hey, that daughter of yours. Hey, that son of yours. Right? He says, this son of yours. And it's amazing because the father brings it 360 and reminds him this is about family. This isn't about work and who gets, who's good and who's favored and who's getting the stuff. And so he brings a full circle and the father says, hey, listen, man, we have to celebrate because this brother of yours, did you hear that? He said, this son of yours, no, 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 this brother of yours, but we forget because we like to think we're better because we have God. <laughs> we're not better. Not if we're not on the front porch with them every day looking for our lost brothers and sisters in Christ. Because that's what family does. That's what family does. That's what family does. Not, oh, they get what they deserve. There's only room for heartache and celebration. And if your heart don't break, we need to ask God to give us his heart more and more. We need to surrender more and more. Amen. And if we don't celebrate, like that little girl, she was sitting right there, right there. You might get saved today, brother. I know, Todd. I'm only kidding. All right? She's sitting right. I feel the spirit moving right there, brother. All right? But I know, Todd and Cindy, we can play around. All right? So, but, but seriously, I mean, I mean, just like her. And there was celebration. And you know what? I, if I'm honest, I thought to myself immediately, because you know the Bible says when one lost sinner repents that there's a celebration in heaven, and like the angels are rejoicing. And I thought to myself, I'm not, I don't feel as rejoiced as I should right now. And I was excited and happy, but I was like, 
we got to kind of, I was like moving on with the program almost. And I was kind of convicted. I wasn't so celebratory. As I stood right here, and a young girl gave her life to Jesus. There's only room for celebration. Here's the next thing. God doesn't see ideologies. Because he's a father, he only sees image bearers. I mean, I know we care about what our kids think, but what, do what our kids believe and, and, and what they choose, is that, I mean, does that really change our love? No way. I mean, God's children believe all sorts of different things about all sorts of different stuff, don't they? Because, you see, we like to think that only like in this room or in this state or in this country or right wherever local is, that's kind of where God's believers are. <laughs> and they're all over the world. I get to go to Peru and Mexico, got to go to Israel, and we find believers everywhere. And they believe all sorts of stuff about all sorts of different things, but there's one thing they believe. Uh, every one of them. Jesus is Lord. Amen. Jesus is Lord. And when I go to Peru, there aren't Democrats or Republicans or Independents. None of that is going on. There's different stuff going on there, though. I mean, just, what do we, just we get caught up. I get it. But if we, if, we're, if we see God's image in people, that changes things. If we see brothers and sisters, that changes things, yes? All right? See, beliefs and behavior don't change image. But we get caught up, and if there's one thing we get caught up as much as beliefs, it's people's behavior, yes? We, be, we define people by how they behave, don't we? Behavior gets in the way of beauty. Seeing God's image in people. Well, don't you know this is how they live? This is what they do? I mean, that was the woman at the well for Jesus. That was Matthew, the tax collector. I mean, we can name all sorts of bad behavior people in Scripture that Jesus reached out to. That was Paul, the Christian killer. Like, you, I mean, you gotta, we got to put this in context. There ain't no politician in America been killing Christians. And Paul was killing them, and his name was getting spread, it says, that when he first got saved, Christians wouldn't go near him. Barnabas had to come to his aid and be like, hey, listen, this guy's for real. Like, he's not, if he comes to your service, like, he's not going to kill you. <laughs> but he was. Like, and, and Jesus showed himself to him. Because Paul, even though he was behaving badly, in actually a tremendous way, Jesus always saw his image in him. He never lost his worth or his value, even though he was behaving badly. The beauty of his image creator and image bearer was there. Listen, for those of you in here, maybe you're like the prodigal son, and you feel like, Phew, you know, I, I don't even feel like a daughter. I don't feel worthy to be a daughter or a son. Listen, how you feel doesn't change how God sees you. He sees you as image bearer. He sees himself in you. You have innate, inherent worth and value. There are blessings for all because of this. So because all, right, are image bearers, it's funny, we think this is a new thing with the New Testament. This has always been the case, right? We saw in Genesis, and watch this. You're talking 2,000 years after Adam and Eve, Abraham, God's going to make himself a nation to be those who would be light. We're going to find out to share the gospel, right? So watch this. Blessings for all, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now listen to this. He says this to Abraham. Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. It means his favor is going to be with him. And I will make your name great, and you will be noticed. A blessing. He says, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And watch this. Does he limit? Is there any limit in what God says here? And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Who's God looking for? All peoples. A long time before you and I ever came on the scene, a long time before there were certain nations that existed, right? He says, all peoples will be blessed. And he goes on. All right? So listen, blessings for all. And all made in God's image are worthy of these two things, justice and salvation. That's what the light means. Because God wants to bless all people for all time 
and he wants to use his people. That was Abraham and the Israelites, and now it's what? It's us? He says, here's what I want you to bring, because here's who my son Jesus, here's, here's what he did. He brought justice and salvation to everyone. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is not a New Testament idea. This is a very Old Testament idea. Check this out. This is Isaiah 42.1. It says, here is my servant. This is prophesying about Jesus. So this is what Jesus came to show us. Here is, my, this, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, talking about Jesus. And notice what Jesus was anointed to do when he came. And he will bring justice to the nations. Israel should have been reading their Bibles. They should have known this. They should have known this, this wasn't a, you know, an exclusive gospel. It wasn't just for them. They were those who were to share it. They were the messengers. Does that make sense? You guys with me? That's us too. A lot of times we just think it's for us and we got our own exclusive party and sorry, too bad for everyone else who's on the outside. If you happen to get in, great. What? <laughs> Dana just said it's a cult. <laughs> it could, yeah, it sounds like it. Check this next one out, right? Isaiah 49, 6, talking about Jesus again. It says this, Is it too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept? I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Notice what it says. I will make you a light for who? The Gentiles. The Israelites didn't like the Gentiles. Didn't they read Isaiah? <laughs> I will make you a light. What is light? I'm going to use you to reflect who I am. That's exactly what Jesus did, yes? He came to reflect and show the character of the Father. It says that my, why? What's the purpose? That my salvation may reach where? Just Jerusalem? Judea? No, to the uttermost parts, Jesus tells the disciples, yes? That reach to the ends of the earth. I appreciate that amen because I don't get amen with students. All right, so <laughs> you never hear amen to students. All right, no, I'm just going to start doing that instead of here. All right, keep going. So listen, don't, 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 you know, can't pick on the Israelites too much because you can see the disciples who are Israelites, they didn't get it either, right? Because here's the story you have in Luke 9.55. In Luke 9.55, here's what happens. They're, they're, going, they're, in Samaria, they're in Samaria right now, right, which is a hated people, all right? You're talking bigotry at its height, right, between the Jews who, who saw themselves as the pure bloodline of, of the nation of Israel, of Abraham, and then you had the Samaritans who were kind of, they, they decided they saw them as a mixed breed with the Assyrians um, who conquered them earlier. And so there was tremendous just hatred, between them. And so the disciples are in Samaria, and the, and the Samaritans aren't being very nice to Jesus and the disciples at this time. And so uh, James and John, known as the sons of thunder, say, hey, Jesus, you want, us to, you want us to rain down fire from heaven and destroy them? And listen, they meant it. <laughs> like, they were serious. Like, the, these, I mean, just think of the contempt for the Samaritans, that they would say that. Like, you got to step back for a second and, like, realize they meant that because they had read their Bibles, at least this part, where Elijah did that once before and rained down fire. And so let's get rid of these guys. And Jesus says, the Bible says he rebuked them. And some translations say, or older manuscripts say, that he said, you don't even know what spirit you're of, but it ain't mine. I mean, come on, we wouldn't say this out loud, but are there a people group we'd like to rain fire down on? We don't know what spirit we're of at that moment. Jesus rebuked them for that. There was another question asked of Jesus, just a little more subtly. <laughs> Not, who should we, can we rain fire down on them as much as, so who is my neighbor? In fact, this is, um, uh, uh, it takes place where an expert in the law approaches Jesus. And uh, he says, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, I don't know. What do the commandments say? And the expert in the law says, well, says, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you've answered well. And then it says, 
The man wanting to justify himself asks Jesus this next question, and it almost seems like they don't relate. He says, who is my neighbor, by the way? Because he just said, what? Love God and love neighbor. And Jesus said, yep, you got it right. You're doing good. And the man says, but wait, Jesus, who is my neighbor? And you know what follows? The story everyone knows, whether they're usually Christians or not, right? The story of the good Samaritan. And we let the word Samaritan roll off our tongues like it's no problem. No Jew could let that word roll off their tongues like it's no problem. For us, Samaritan's a good thing. For them, it was not. Just put like a blank for you. Who's the people group you are contempt toward? That's your Samaritans. And if Jesus was talking to us today, he would put so blank people group in this parable for you and me. And he would say a certain blank, <laughs> well, not there yet, but he said a man was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, which means he was probably a really good Jew because he was going from Jerusalem where you really worship God. And he finds that he gets robbed, left half for dead. And you guys know the story, right? All of a sudden, a priest comes by. And what does he do? Because that would be unclean, a man who looks half dead, to touch him. He goes on the other side of the street. Then a Levite comes by, right? He does the same thing, yes? And then it says, uh, ready? Wait for it. Hiccup. Uh, Samaritan. And everyone in the crowd would have went, what? I wonder what's going to happen here. He's, he's going to look way worse than the, because the priest and the Levite, they'd have been like, oh, good, I'm glad they didn't touch that guy. <laughs> right? Because they're being religious. They were doing a good thing. <laughs> and he says, a Samaritan comes. And he says, and what does he do? Takes care of him, bandages him up, takes him to an inn, pays for him. Says, hey, if there's even extra on the account, charge me. I'll come back and I'll pay more if I have to. And then Jesus says this, who was a neighbor to that man? And of course, it actually says it like this. The expert in the law says, I suppose... I suppose it was the Samaritan. And Jesus said, yes, go and do likewise. Let me tell you what that parable isn't. It's, it's, it's not an Aesop's fable. It's not a teaching on doing good. It's a teaching on God's image in everyone. Because we think, listen, let me just say this. Do you understand? We don't look like God. God is spirit. We look nothing like God. But do you know God looks like us in the person of Jesus Christ? <laughs> we don't look like God at all. In fact, he has no image or form. Because image, as it means in the Old Testament and understood through the New Testament, means how we, who we, what we're made of and how we behave in a way. The image is our character. That's why the fruits of the Spirit are an ear, a nose, hair color, it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It's all a character that comes from a heart, yes? See, that's the image of God. That's what Jesus came to show us. What we were supposed to look like if we lived, right, before the fall. Bearing the image of God. Do you know who bore the image of God in that parable? The Samaritan. Do you know who looked like Jesus in that parable? The Samaritan. Because image isn't what we look like, it's how we live toward one another. See, he was saying, do you understand my image is on everyone? And let me prove it, because the very people you think aren't, don't even, aren't even close to having my image have my image, and I'll prove it, because look what he did. So you go bear my image and do likewise. See, we write people off. But Jesus says everyone's capable of good because they're made in my image. Even the Samaritan. Even our blank. You guys tracking with me? See, God doesn't see labels. He sees loss. He doesn't see labels, but we see labels, don't we? I mean, we're labeling people all the time. Oh, he or she, oh, don't you know she's a, oh, don't you know he's a, you know? The only label I like is Italian. I like that label. <laughs> I'm good with it. It means good food, Good family traditions, I'm good. 
Now, a lot of other people don't like that, but I'm good with it. All right? You with me? All right? And, I, and I'm good if you make me meatballs. You know what I'm saying? I got them right there. All right, here we go. So here we go. So here's God sees what should be, and that's why he sees the loss. Because, listen, when, when our children are born, those of you who are parents, we have all these grand ideas and dreams for our kids, don't we? And we know what, what a good life, if we could say that, should look like for our kids. And then when, if we start to see them drift or not living out what we know is good for them, what do we see? We see the loss of what should be. That's what God sees when he looks at some of us, or all of us, really. See, he doesn't see a label. He sees his image. And when he sees his image and he sees his broken children, he sees what should be. But the good news is he can restore all that. He can renew all that. He can heal our brokenness. You guys with me? And so he sees loss of freedom, dignity, and hope, right? So look at Matthew 9, 36. And this is Jesus. And notice, because this is what's exactly what you see in the person of Jesus. This is what it means to have compassion, which literally means with passion. It's kind of a Latin term. It means with passion. Father, he taught us that in Israel. Um, with passion. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. He was moved. You know why? Because he saw the loss. He saw what should be. I mean, you and I relate. I mean, when, when, we, when we drive by people who are hurting, we see what could have been. When we go to New York City, we teach our kids, talk, talk, talk to the people we're ministering to. You have to hear the stories. All you hear is stories of loss and loss and loss, and here they are on the street, homeless, and I'm telling you, people have law degrees. People have all sorts and accomplish all sorts of things, all sorts of potential. Gone. Gone. And your heart breaks. But it has to do more than break. Compassion has to move in. We have to share that pain with them and do something. Because that's what compassion does if it's real. It does something. See, it says this. He had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Why? Because we were never supposed to be harassed. We were never supposed to be helpless. And we were never supposed to be sheep that we're without our shepherd. Amen. See, this kind of love sees loss. Do you and I see loss? Because that's where compassion comes from. When we, when we have God's eyes like that. In fact, check this out. All right? Here's what compassion is about. It's all about restoring freedom, dignity, and hope. If, if you're moving in compassion, we we'll always look to set the oppressed free. We'll do something toward that. We'll always look to restore dignity, God's image, value, worth back in that person. Yes? Absolutely. And we'll always look to restore hope. But the cool thing is, when you start, if you can go back a little bit, Nathan, I apologize. If you, if you start restoring someone's, restoring, apologize, typo, restoring, restoring someone's freedom and dignity, it's amazing. Hope is pretty much the result. Amen? And that's exactly why Jesus came, to do all of those things. Luke 4.18 says this. This is Jesus when he's in the synagogue, in his hometown, and he gets up and he takes the scroll of Isaiah, and everyone's there, and he reads these verses about himself as he's beginning his ministry. This is what he says. He says, the spirit of the Lord is on me, that's why the capital M, because he, and I forgot to capitalize the Father again, forgive me, long weekend. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Keep going, watch this. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. See, that was Jesus' mission, and do you know what he did? He bestowed that mission on us in Matthew 28. See, that's what it means to go and do likewise. And do you know who our neighbor is? Everyone we're near. See, do you know why, the, do you know why the, the expert in the law asked that question? Who is my neighbor wanting to justify himself? Because here's what he was really asking. Who can I hate and get away with it? Who don't I have to love and it's okay? That's exactly what he was asking. And Jesus said, well, let me tell you, no one. <laughs> no one. 
Because I'm going to use the person you hate most as the hero in the story. I'm going to show you the person you hate most still bears the image of God, even though you think you're the only one who does. See, that's powerful. See, this is what Jesus comes. Let me tell you something. Jesus isn't nice, but he's loving. Very loving, because he tells us the truth. And he tells it in love, because he, because he understands we're merely clay. And he gets that it's going to take time and grace. But we've got to say yes. We've got to do our part. And we've got to confess, and we've got to repent and say, forgive me. Repentance just doesn't mean turn around. It also means change of mind. Change of mind, change of position. We've got to think differently. We've got to think the way God does. Amen? Amen. Compassion doesn't criticize. Compassion calls out. Boy, I promise you, I mean, some of us think criticism is a spiritual gift. I'm telling you, Criticism is not a spiritual gift. <laughs> All right? It is not a spiritual gift. The devil's really good at it. I'm sorry, that hurt. But listen, <laughs> but it is not a spiritual gift. All right? It isn't. And compassion calls out. Do you know what I mean by calling out? I don't mean like calling out someone calling them out. I mean, it calls out, affirms the image of God in other people. It calls out God-given image in people, God-given uniqueness. It looks for God's image in people when it's hard to. See, when, when we go around, we need to be looking for God's image in people because I promise you it's there. If you look hard enough, there isn't a person I encounter as, as I've started by God's grace to, to grow in this area that I can't find his image in. And if I was messing around and my youth was here and my leaders were around, I'd point to one of my leaders and say, except for you. But I must say, <laughs> but I mean, isn't that true, right? God calls out. And I'm going to share these two quick things and then we're done. Here's what it is. He affirms the image of God in other people, just like the prison angel. You can check her out. It's a great book, right? She's called The Prison Angel. It's uh, the story of Mother Antonia who uh, literally lived at one of the harshest prisons in Mexico um, for 30 years. Um, she was a very wealthy woman who lived in California and uh, in her early 20s decided she was going to go and become a nun. And she served in this prison. And it's an amazing, beautiful story of a life very well lived. And she would see those prisons, I mean the most hardened of criminals, I mean, you name it, just put the label there. They all had them. And you know what she would say to those prisoners all the time? She would say, there's goodness in you because you're made in the image of God. God loves you. There's goodness in you. And it's amazing. As she started to tell those prisoners that, they actually over time began to believe her. And it's amazing. They actually began to live like it. Read the book. Do you understand when we're compassion and tender toward people, that brings about compassion and tender in them? That's why it says a soft answer turns away wrath. But we just, we just fight back with the same stuff. We're harsh, we're harsh, we're harsh. And then and we, I don't understand why nothing changes. <laughs> you know why? And some of us are like, well, I tried that. I know, we tried it for a day. We tried it for a week. I'm talking, I'm talking days, weeks, months, years. Or like God the Father from eternity past to now. He's never stopped reaching out and saying, I see my image in you. There's good in you because I created you. And that's how we're called to live. Last quote is a really cool quote by Peter Van Bremen. Um, it's in one of his books. I don't even know who this guy is. I just found the quote, and it's really good. It's a, it's a, it's a story of a journalist um, going to interview this guru, this really wise sage. And this is just kind of the dialogue real quick. It says this. It says this is the journalist saying, Are you a genius, as some people say? You might say so, answered the guru with a smile. And what makes a genius, asked the reporter, and the guru says, the ability to see. Now watch what he says, the ability to see what? Check this out. The journalist was betwixt 
Um, that's, that's not a new candy bar, kids. All right, he was betwixt and between, scratching his hair with one hand and rubbing his tummy with the other. He muttered, to see what? To see what? The guru quietly replied, the butterfly in a caterpillar, the eagle in an egg, the saint in a selfish person, life and death, unity and separation, God in the human, and the human in God. This is how we have to live, people. And please let us not point fingers at anyone else. This is how we're called to live, period. There is no room for finger pointing, I promise you. It is only on our knees, praying for ourselves and praying for others that we are called to be. And that's exactly what the New Testament says. Pray for all men. And pretty much says it like this. Pray for everyone. Pray for even politicians and kings and governors and all those in authority. Pray, pray, pray. Not point, point, point. Pray. Because listen, not only does it hurt the people that we're pointing at, it always hurts us. Because anytime you and I aren't acting like we were created to act, we're the ones who get hurt. Hurt is contagious. It always spreads. It always spreads. You, you think COVID's contagious. <laughs> no way. Not even half as contagious as hurt. Because if we don't let God deal with our hurt and ask for forgiveness for our own sins and forgive others who've sinned against us, and that's what Jesus says, that's how you're going to deal with the heart, you, things ain't going to go well. It's not going to go well. Because we weren't made for any of that. We were made to love. Love God and love neighbor. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, this is hard. Because our fallen nature um, is present. But I thank you that um, your truth, your love, your grace does set us free. Father, it always starts with repentance, so I pray pray for everyone, including myself, Lord God, that, that you would help us to confess and say, God, forgive me, forgive me. And here's the beauty of you, like, like the good father in the story of the, of the prodigal son, he's right there. And he says, I forgive you, I love you, you're my son, you're my daughter. I already forgave you. That's what I did at Calvary. I took care of all that. But Father, we need to confess. And Father, we need to forgive others. Because we've pointed the finger and we've created a them when there should only be an us. We've made people into the enemy. Someone who gets in the way when we should have been on the porch with the Father the whole time praying for them to come home. Because sin truly does rob us of sonship on both sides. Father, would you restore that sonship in our hearts and minds first? That when we look out, we do see sons and daughters of the living God. That we truly do see, I mean, that's our prayer right now, right? That we see You and them, and them and you. Father, that's a work only you can do. So, Lord, we pray, do that work deep in our hearts. It's in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. And all God's people said, amen.